The Diplomacy Dojo is a weekly discussion led by your board brother about diplomacy tactics and strategies. Let's listen in on what our players are discussing this week. Yeah, I really loved your conversation a few weeks ago about face-to-face. That's why I reached out. Well, it makes sense. I haven't played face-to-face diplomacy in uh, quite some time now. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's such an experience. I, I haven't played it very many times, but I played it not that long ago. I played it in, uh, in November with a group of guys. It kind of rejuvenated my interest in the game, honestly, because it's so much more exhilarating for me. Yeah, I understand. Just just the experience of six other people trying to negotiate, trying to manage the time, as you were saying in that last recording, be appealing to people in a way that you can just kind of like not manage it easily. So I think it helps to have an eighth person to act as a game master. One of the the struggles with playing face-to-face is getting all the orders executed on time, and that can kind of slow down the game. So if you got uh, an eighth friend who's willing to sit it out and just resolve the peace movements, I think that can really add to the experience. I believe the game rules even recommend that, like the -the out-of-the-box game rules, or at least some version did. Yeah, I, uh, I, yeah, I definitely would have done that if I could have. We, I mean, I think most people have this experience, which is probably why in-person diplomacy can be difficult because getting seven people together is hard, hard enough. Getting eight people together is even harder. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a, you know, a, a, you know, I'm sure a tournament is different where everyone's there, and it's kind of like that's why you're all there, you know, in that area. That's true. I, I would say that that's a, a flaw with diplomacy compared to games like, say, poker where just whatever number of people that shows up you can play with, it's quite flexible. Diplomacy isn't. It's not a very good game if you have not all seven players. And if you have, let's say, nine people and no one, you can't, you know, (laughs) even if you have a game master, where are you going to do this other person? So you have to have a very precise number of players, either seven or eight. Yeah, it's different that way. I mean, it's obviously intensive in the sense that it it doesn't require that, but it strongly encourages you to maximize the number of players up to seven because the dynamics multiply with the other players. So yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound like either of us have like an insane amount of experience in face to face. I think both of us have an insane amount of experience with negotiating whatever in real life face to face. I kind of thought, <laughs> you know, we're, we're kind of both, I feel like we're both a little unqualified. We still could carry on a legitimately useful conversation about this. Well, my experience playing in face to face diplomacy comes from playing with my friends at most points in my life, I have at least one, sometimes a couple groups of friends that get together and play games consistently. Diplomacy has been one of those games that I've been able to play with my friends. I have no tournament experience in face-to-face diplomacy. Every time a major tournament comes up that seems like I really should go to, something happens that takes priority, you know, like some, like, oh, I got to go to my grandpa's 90th birthday. It's that weekend. There's just no way. (laughs) can say that I'm, right. that I'm skipping that right not a valid excuse for that right i hope to i'm i'm pretty i've played plenty of other games in face-to-face tournaments and other competitive activities in general so i feel pretty comfortable that i can show up in tournament version of diplomacy and hold my right. own with my online tournament experience i have played face-to-face in a friendly setting and i've played other games in tournaments i feel pretty confident i i just want to know how good right. i really am but I won't know until I go right. to the tournament. Yeah, I feel like, I don't remember who, who were you talking, the guy you were talking with recently about this face-to-face, I don't remember who that was, but I remember one of the things he said when he was talking about it, he was just like, "There's it's so different being able to just take time to compose messages versus having to fly about and talk to people it quickly. Is. It is It is completely you know? different. It's very, well, My experiences, the conversations are much more game-centric when you're under this time limit, very, very quick discussions of precise tactical things. Even if you're talking strategy, it's usually about the, the relationship of the powers or something. Whereas if you're playing a, a long, drawn-out online press game that lasts six to eight weeks, you could afford to send messages just shooting the breeze. Right. Right. There's a lot of room for extras. Going along with that, I think it just calls into service a lot of skills that just, I, I think if you're not ready for it, can just kind of sneak up on you, basically. Like, I need to be ready to appear authentic, enthusiastic, optimistic. It's like I have to, like, kind of get myself ready for, like, for all of these unpredictable things that could happen. 
in this situation. I think that's why I came up with the idea that I put in the outline about dating and the difference because I met my spouse online. So did I. Really? Yes. Okay, cool. So we, we understand each other then. Yes. So like, <laughs> there's a huge transition there, right? Because you're, you're just messaging and you're like, oh, I love talking to this person. This is like, it's totally controlled. I take time. I do it. I think I can feel likable, even if I'm not actually likable, whatever. But like when you meet them, it's like, all right, let's go. Let's talk. Let's hang out. Let's see what you're, what you're looking at. Let's see, you know, what you laugh at. Let's, you get all that stuff in a, in a smaller way. Like you said, it's concentrated in diplomacy because there's time limits on the turns, even, you know, when it's face to face. But you have to like be a likable person. You can't compose it. I agree. I'll just add some thoughts on this about being a likable person. I think some people are saddled with a unhelpful belief that you just are or aren't a likable person because it's very difficult to change the habits that would change how people perceive and respond to you. But I think that it ultimately comes down to habits and things like listening to what someone's saying and saying a response that actually implies that you comprehended what they said, looking people in the eye, smiling, just habitually smiling, whether it makes sense or not, just smile at people. And if you get, you know, five or 10 habits like that, that you didn't have before, if you get, you do them every time, your likability factor will increase a lot. It's not much of a substantive change, but I think that's, I think that's a big part of it. To make the comparison to the online situation, like you were saying before, you can be uh, sitting down with the worst posture, a surly look on your face, you know, uh, <laughs> writing somebody a really thoughtful message about how sweet their pet dog is. And it will come across that way because you have time and the capability to totally craft the presentation of your message. But uh, in person, if you want it to come across with the same level of charm, it's probably important to have an, some automatic habits that uh, show the other person that you're attentive and interested in what they're saying and that you're sincere. Yeah, and I think that those ads such a such a great advantage at such a low cost, like you said, because there's they can be so little to add, but like you can get beneath the substance of the conversation, right? The the content of the conversation, the words that are used in the conversation, just by the way that you use your mannerisms and your nonverbals. I don't want to say you could have like a totally crummy message because you have to have some kind con- of decent content, but like you can plus up that way and get, get an advantage for low cost. And the best part is the person doesn't realize it because you're not persuading them of it, right? You're not using logic to persuade them. That's right. You're using nonverbal communication to indicate confidence or sincerity or whatever the case may be. The reverse also applies that um, if you've been playing online for a long time, you probably have not developed habits of composure that not only do you want to go out of your way to be a friendly person when playing diplomacy face to face and be charming, but you got to retain your composure when it comes time to lie. (laughs) That's eventually going to happen. I'll share a story. So one of the players who I played many games with, including diplomacy is uh, my younger sister. And we played all kinds of games throughout our life, including diplomacy. We were playing a, a, a game one time, and she said to another player that I was lying, and she knew this because my toes had curled up under my feet. She was absolutely right. I don't remember if I talked my way out of it or not, but that made me aware that I had this tell that I wasn't aware of before, that, that like the, ner- the, t- the tension or whatever caused me to clench my feet up unconsciously. It was the time you'd be wearing shoes when you play a game with somebody. Uh, But since it's a family game, (laughs) we're playing at home. Uh, But it made me conscious after that, not just in diplomacy, but but other games. You know, I need to mm, I need to not curl up my body parts in tension when I'm doing something that's nerve wracking, like a major, major lie in a game. That reminds me of Rounders, that movie a while back with in John Malkovich's character when I think with Matt Damon figured out what he was doing with Oreos during the card game. That was his tell with what he was doing with Oreos. And then he threw the whole tray off of, Ore- of Oreos off the table when he figured that out. <laughs> There's a lot to that that um when you're playing a competitive game in person, most people are not gonna tell you that they discovered your tells. They will just use that against you and somehow inexplicably, you know, how can how can this person read me? 
but they figured out some impulse or habit that you do, something about how the tone of your voice wavers or you look away or something, you know, if you're, if you're the person who's on the lookout for this, none of that exists in online diplomacy. Certainly there are tells, in my opinion, there are tells in online diplomacy. They're just very different and they're not based on body language. They're based on how the person's composing their messages and going about playing. So for my experience in online diplomacy, for instance, I consider a, a major tell that somebody is lying that the frequency or timing of their press to me has changed. And if that's happening at a moment in the game when I see how they might have an incentive to backstab me, that's a big red flag because probably this has happened because they're putting all their attention on another player. They're going to set fire to the alliance with me by backstabbing me so they're not putting the same level of attention that they were before. Good players will, will put an excuse in there and say, I'm so sorry I've been really busy with work or school or something, and that's why I haven't really been replying to you. They will say that, and so you got to try to verify. I've, I'm experienced enough that I that I know to verify that. I go, hey, has so and so, you know, not really been sending messages right. to anybody because no, they've been sending messages to me. Uh huh. That's what I thought. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and I and I put you know my defensive orders to try to protect uh, from the backstab if I, that I've detected. There's something like that in face to face diplomacy, but. It's usually that kind of stuff is a lot more obvious where someone's spending their time because you can look and see who each person is talking to. If they say they went to the bathroom, I mean, I guess they could like both sneak into the bathroom and try to (laughs) try to talk to each other there. I mean, I've I've seen crazier things. Right. Well, and I try to kind of like want to tell with I communicate with you right down to the minute I'm killing you, basically, in diplomacy. And I and I try and I keep it up at a level that I think can be infuriating, but it actually really made one guy mad sometimes. I, I didn't mean to, but like, I mean, I just, I didn't want him to know. So I kept talking with him and creating complicated, you know, ideas and plans and, and thoughts. And like, it wasn't an obvious situation where, you know, he was really vulnerable to me, but it was a situation where I was just working other players into an alliance with me against him. But I just kept working and talking to him. And when I did it, he, sh- he sent me a message afterward. He's like, why did you keep talking to me so much? Why did you send me a long message at the end? I was like, because I can't have you knowing that like this was about to fall apart. Like if I stop talking to you, you're gonna immediately figure it out. I mean, maybe he wouldn't have, but like, you know, I'm I'm trying to protect that. And and I do the same thing when I play face to face. I don't one of the things I I, know, I put in the outline was that I, I try to keep up a perception of like diplomatic movement among the other players because I think it causes players to think, what is this person doing? Like, yes, I, don't, I can't trust them, but like, sure, this is diplomacy. You really can't trust them exactly. <laughs> but why are they talking to everybody? And if I stab them, what are the implications of that? Maybe they're telling me the truth, but telling them a lot. Like, it, it kind of confuses it because I feel like if you make it too easy for someone to figure out who you're talking to all the time, then it's like, okay, well, and that's hard, like you said, to disguise in face to face diplomacy because you can't just run off to the bathroom or around the corner all the time or the hallway or something. It makes it easier to kind of hide among the chaos if you create a lot of diplomatic movement, regardless of the, of the significance of each individual movement. So, I mean, it may not be personally beneficial to you. You may not actually be in alliance with this person. But if you're talking to these people and people are like, well, maybe he's in alliance with that guy. Or maybe he's in alliance with that guy. I hope he's in alliance with me. Something that I like to remember, I wish I could, could find it uh, easily. I like this old political cartoon from the time period that diplomacy is set in, from the time and place that diplomacy is set. It's a European political cartoon from the 1900s or the late 1800s, maybe. It shows a caricature of Bismarck, I think, and he's got arms going out of every side of his body, shaking hands with a caricature of of each of the different nations of Europe. And I think the personification of France is in tears no, no one's shaking uh, her hand. Right. And th- th- I wish I could remember the name of it or something so that I could find this cartoon I, I saw. Reading history is not... I've I seen it. Okay, you've seen it. Yeah, it's a, I guess a famous image. Yeah, I, I, I really like Bismarck, as you can probably guess from my name that I've said this before. I really like him. So I've seen it and I love it. And that's what I try to do. Cool. Well, so then I, we're speaking the same language. That's the image right. that comes to mind with that strategy that you could just make friends with every player and decide who to attack later or as the situation right. unfolds. Right. Right. Cause I, I'm talking to all these people and I'm trying to kind of suss out what's going on all over the place. And then just kind of allowing that to kind of process in my unconscious and come to my conscious mind. And I'm like, all right, so this guy's going to be, this guy's probably the one that he, this is public enemy number one first. Right. 
In face-to-face diplomacy, in my experience, these things are a lot more obvious because the players only have so much time and it's usually clear who they're working with. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I thought you were going to say more. That's why I wasn't saying anything. Oh, okay. Because uh, there's only so much time per turn, figuring out the moves and making deals can consume their time. Usually you can see sometimes there are multiple players sitting together into an alliance. And from what I've experienced, alliance play is a lot more common where even players who are exclusively face-to-face diplomacy players who've not played significant drawn-out online games, they think of diplomacy as kind of like, uh, remember the reality show Survivor? <laughs> yeah, my spouse is in love with that show. Okay. So by, by making a comparison here that you can, you can think of the game as not so much a tactical game or one of shifting alliances all the time or whatever, but rather who's the next one to be voted out? Who's getting right. voted out next? And that uh, you pick your ally or a couple of allies early on and then sort of play the game out. And sometimes there's, there's more complexity to it, uh, but that, that attitude's a lot more common in face-to-face diplomacy because there's just not – the humans playing the game don't have the resources – to develop every single alliance to such an extent or the mental space to change sides turn after turn, it's hard to do within that time frame. And indeed, I think the best, to my knowledge, some of the most successful face-to-face tournament players are really well known as alliance players of this kind, that they get an ally or two very early on in the game and they just play that as far as it will go. And the game at that mm-hmm. point, this kind of alliance strategy your other conversations are more about debilitating the other players, you know, make, make, causing them to make right. tactical mistakes and so on so that your alliance can advance. And if you're good and you know how to play this way, you can act like your, your alliance that, you know, you, you're, you're playing like conjoined twins, but no, 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 really, we're about to stab each other any second now. You see that in online diplomacy, to be sure. Uh, but my impression is that that's more common and a lot more successful right. in face-to-face diplomacy, especially in tournaments. Yeah, the face-to-face game I played in November, I was Turkey, and I had an idea that I really wanted to try out the Russian nightmare thing. And so I was like, let me let me see if I can figure out a way, like if, if Germany's any good, I'll figure out a way to talk with them. And I, and I talked with them, like you said, in a way that was as an ally, but I didn't talk to them very often because it wasn't necessary early on. But I was very clear with them, and they were pretty clear with me. And yeah, and we both worked to kind of create chaos, you know, in the Italy, Austria, Russia corridor the whole time. Which they were trying, you know, Russia's trying to get in bed with me. Austria's trying to get in bed with, with Germany during this whole thing. But at the whole time, Germany and I are, are, are the only two who are actually being, like, let's just say, quote, honest with each other. And the rest of them are on the periphery. Because as you said, you can't you don't have time to commit to alliances with all of the players and they're not all going to join an alliance with you because people want substance out of an alliance and the conversation is not substance. But they do enjoy talking and they do enjoy intel and they do enjoy a friendly personality. So you can even if you can borrow sixty seconds of someone's time, it can still waste a lot more than sixty seconds of their time working through it. And you also gotta sow some wild oats, as they say. Like you don't know exactly how everything's gonna play out. Maybe you'll have to change sides or they will. And uh, you'll be grateful that you had something going when that time came. Right. I mean, I always like four allies because you can feel like you can be more honest to them anyway. So not completely honest, but a little bit more honest. I agree. At least they can be more counted on to do something that's in your interest since your interests usually overlap so much. Right. 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 One of the things I wanted to talk about, I want to hear your thoughts on this. I feel like I was kind of going on a rabbit hole with it, but just the, the notion of self-perception because you get this kind of reinforcement from talking to another person that you just don't get when you get a message. Again, this is my, my point of view and how your perception of yourself influences your gameplay when you're constantly getting person to person feedback from other folks, it's almost like speed dating. I see. So let me see if I understand. Are you referring to the the phenomenon that in an in-person interaction, you get continuous feedback even as you are speaking? Right. I see. That's very interesting. Okay. So in my experience as a diplomacy player, the hobby leans really far towards people that are either highly educated or intellectual in some way. It's pretty rare that somebody's not either a student or someone who has gotten a college degree or even an advanced degree. In my experience, I'm not uh, denigrating someone who, who doesn't pursue a higher education. I just mean that that's who I find in the hobby. Now, this is 
maybe stereotyping a little bit, but I think this is a productive to the conversation that I think such a crowd tends to be really interested in their thoughts and getting out their idea and speaking in order to get their ideas out to other people and not so much paying attention to the communication that someone else is giving. Like I have even, I have mm. played diplomacy and other games of this kind with someone who will even like, uh, they almost look away or close their eyes because they're trying so hard to concentrate on their thoughts and saying them to somebody else, which is really useful in a situation where you need to concentrate and the content of what you're saying is really important, but not so great in a situation where the personal connections matter so much. You're like throwing away this whole line of communication that you're referring to of being able to see the feedback of what someone's saying. Now, I'll say that I'm someone who has worked really hard to not do that. I think that's my natural tendency. I I do think that I acted that way a lot when I was younger. But as I've become older and wiser, I've tried really hard to concentrate on the reaction that I'm seeing from the other person to what I'm saying. And uh, this matters in diplomacy quite a bit, that I can start a sentence. And if I see partway through the sentence that you're not really taking a liking to what I'm saying... I can make sure to end it with, well, you know, that was just my idea anyway, <laughs> or, or something mm, that, you know, that, right. he, that hedges uh, and doesn't come on. My crazy straight. idea. <laughs> uh-huh. Whereas if I can tell that you're really liking it, maybe I'll lean into it even more and keep adding to what I was saying because it seems to be successful. And good people persons, which is all kinds of people out there, or there's all sorts of people. But if you're a good people person, you'll pay attention to those cues that you're getting. You're getting continuous feedback from how you're mm-hmm. communicating with them and know to prune some lines of speech that maybe are not productive and to deepen the thoughts that are getting a good reaction. Right. But if you're not, you may just continue droning. Mm-hmm. And then let's just run with that generalization for a second and say that, you know, there are 51% of the people who play diplomacy are like that. And they're they're talking and they're talking and they're mostly focused on formulating their own thoughts. What if the, they perceive at some point when they open their eyes or at some point when, you know, when they stop talking that the other person doesn't like what they have to say? But they're used to kind of like living in this like interior world of like, well, I'm putting this out. I'm thinking about what I'm saying. I feel confident what I'm saying. I'm not getting negative feedback because like let's say I've been playing on online diplomacy, but now I'm getting negative feedback it has to affect the quality of my play because I'm not used to getting that. And now I have to process that. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. I'll say that to be successful in diplomacy, you absolutely got to develop a thick skin. You got to do it to be successful. There are diplomacy players out there who are really sensitive, temper tantrum, throwing players and stuff. They exist, but I don't find them to be particularly successful uh, at diplomacy. I played online quite a bit and uh, have gotten incredibly negative feedback during matches, after matches, et cetera. And I, what I, some of it was especially was really stressful, especially when uh, I was less experienced. It was just, it's just stressful to be spoken to that way by another person, or in this case, they, you know, receive written messages that, uh, right. that's, you know, meaner than the meanest boss, uh, <laughs> whatever, whatever, right. right. The way that I developed my thick skin or I toughened up was I came to see this as a part of the fun. When the next time comes that I get a ridiculous explosion from somebody that I'm playing with and they call me a despicable clown, you know, I'm going to laugh and think, you know, that's all right. That's a, that's another notch for the belt. But to think of it like that, that that's, oh, it's part of the fun is, is getting called names or getting a, a difficult right. reaction from somebody. And so applying that to a face-to-face situation I think there is a technique that can really de-escalate a situation real fast. Uh, And I recommend it to anybody, which is if they're getting a negative reaction, just uh, start laughing it off. Just start laughing it off and go, oh, (laughs) oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't didn't mean to I didn't mean to offend or I didn't I, I didn't realize you didn't like that. That's a that's okay. That's okay. Well, tell me tell me something else that works pretty often. I'm not saying it's it's, you know, inerrant that it will always work. But I think that's a really fast, that is a lightning fast way of de-escalating a situation that we're, what you have said has gotten a negative reaction. So just laugh about it and say, whoops, you know, that's not what I want right. it to happen. Yeah, just de-stress it a little bit with your own humor or just with like laughing at yourself, like humility, mm-hmm. self-deprecation. Yeah. 
and that's effective in a lot of situations. I mean, being self-deprecating allows you to to get out of a lot of things. To be like, oh, this guy's just you know he gets it, whatever. Because you're not explaining yourself like why you're why you're going to change suddenly. It's you're just changing suddenly. So again, I think anything you can get, you can kind of get across to somebody below the conscious is more likely to be successful. I agree. At any time that you can persuade somebody using indirect methods, your chances of success are far higher. I've recently taken to using a phrase, if I have done a good job working with somebody, so I'm speaking in the work context, they'll say something like, you know, I have my best ideas when I'm talking to that guy. That's what I want them to think. <laughs> I have my best <laughs> ideas when I'm talking to that guy. Right. So I'll talk to him again. Uh-huh. Right. I mean, I kind of think of it as like, honestly, like, a, and I've said this before to people and they kind of look at me across that, but I said objectives other than winning. I mean, I, I often have objectives other than winning with the diplomacy game, especially if I'm experiencing something in a slightly different way than I have before. Maybe there's a potential for it. an alliance that seems unconventional. Like I, I love to make an Austria Turkey alliance last as long as possible because it just seems so ridiculous. It treats the game like it has so much more to offer than just victory. I don't know. I think there's a games kind of like, you know, you read through an instruction book and it's like, you, you look at the end and you're like, how do I win this thing? And you can get hung up on that. And then the only thing you think about while you're playing the game is that whether or not everything is lining up to put you in on a track to that objective. And with the minute you see yourself off of the objective or like, you know, somebody else is getting there ahead of you. You're like, it just affects the game. It affects your gameplay. It affects your perspective. It affects your in the diplomacy. It affects your negotiations. People quit for stuff like that. But when you have objectives other than winning along with winning, because of course you still want to win, then there are ways you can kind of like shift, right? You can shift the way that you're playing and you can maintain that enthusiasm. And especially with face-to-face diplomacy, it's the same thing with online, actually. It's not really any different. I mean, with both versions of diplomacy, if you can have these kinds of other ways of enjoying the game, regardless of whether or not you see yourself on the track to winning, then you make yourself attractive and people, people might be able to find use in you still, so to speak, you know, the janitary thing or whatever. They're just like, this guy can be an auxiliary to me, or this guy is the things are going poorly. I'm still going to help this person out. And you wouldn't have that were you to, to fall prey to the idea that, you know, there's a one track way to win this. And if I don't get it, screw it. I completely agree. And I'll add some thoughts to that. I'm reminded of the masterpiece of an essay that I had the privilege of getting to republish on the Brotherboard blog by an online player of the moniker Village Idiot. There's not that many out there, but one of the players I consider to be better than myself, who I uh, try to learn from. One of his points in this essay, The Anatomy of a Top Player, is that the best players are playing the game beyond the game, that there's much more at stake than this particular match of diplomacy. You have a reputation as a player that is far more valuable to you than the outcome of any one particular game. And that being understood as someone that people want to play with has incredible value to you as a human being, because if people want to play with you, then you will get invited to play games. You can't win diplomacy if you if you aren't playing it in the first place. And even if you're showing up at tournaments or things where, like, there's gonna, you know for sure there's going to be a game going, that still has considerable value in how you're going to interact with those players because there's no anonymity in a face to face tournament. You you're yourself. And you should represent yourself well. In online diplomacy, where anonymous play is possible, it does nix a lot of that. Anonymous play, don't really don't know who the players are. It's not possible for your reputation to precede you or anything like that. It's a very different dynamic. Right. So a wise face-to-face player of any game is a good sport and uh, fun to play with so that other people will come back for more. They're mm-hmm. gracious when they win. They acknowledge uh, their defeats. Yeah, I finished up. Um, so I was telling you the other day that I came back and won a solo as France, which I felt okay about. But like you did, I was like, well, that kind of happened. And then the game after that, I played, I had jumped in as a replacement in an anonymous game. And at the end of the game, I found out that one of the players who I was in the draw with was like, I think number four on the, on the site I put on play diplomacy. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> 
But, but you don't know, you know, it's, it's an anonymous game. It's just, it's not known to you ahead of time. It's probably a somewhat of an advantage or disadvantage in some way or another for that person to be anonymous. Um, but there's no way, I mean, we can probably have known that in real life that that person was, was a well-rated player. So it's interesting. So the time management thing, I wanted to bring that up because I remember you guys talking about, again, for that previous conversation about time and thinking about a lot about your own time. And this, I think this definitely doesn't apply to tournaments because better players would see through this kind of stuff. But I think that especially with decent to, to newer players, you can manage their own clock in a way that they may, they may not catch on to right away by basically just filling in their time. Not the whole 15 minutes or whatever it is because they would be onto that. But, you know, even if it's five minutes, if you can kind of do that here and there, you can take away from another person's ability to build up their own strategies or to like build up their own alliance with somebody else, which goes back into my diplomatic movement thing. It's all part of the same thing where it's like, be involved, be out there. If you're not making, making hay for yourself, at least be keeping someone else from harvesting any hay. I think on the topic of time, there's an interesting aspect about the, your resource as a human that I think is worth mentioning. This is distinct from the time differences uh, per turn, but rather the time frame of the matches in online diplomacy, in these drawn out matches that last four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, to some degree, you're being just tested on your ability to do any one thing for that long as, as a hobby, it. right? If you, if, if, For me, one of the reasons why I, I'm absolutely sure that I'm successful, this is a big factor and why I'm successful in online diplomacy is that I don't waste any turn. I don't just get, oh, you know, hey, shoot, I got a really busy day, so I just phoned it in that turn. You do that even one time, you probably lose the game, or at least might make winning impossible. And so uh, at certain points in my life, having done played online diplomacy so extensively, day in and day out, year after year for 10 years, there are times when, okay, I'm getting around to diplomacy at 12 a.m., and I'm going to be up for the next hour and a half or two hours, exceed my bedtime, because I have to, or I, everything I've done up until this point and will do after might be wasted if I don't do it every turn without exception. And that's very, that's extremely difficult. That level of commitment is uh, not normal for most people to any hobby, let alone a game. It's very different from other games. Okay, that's a special thing about online diplomacy because it's drawn out. There's a different factor going on when you're playing in tournament games of any kind. Because the tournaments often start early and or go late. And you have to think about logistics like, I need to make sure I eat food that's nourishing and not get so you know hyper-focused on the tournament that I'm competing in that all I do is eat Snickers bars or something. And then <laughs> by the time you get to the 10 p.m., thing of the tournament, you know, with something still going on and your, your brain is not working, right? You're not firing on mm. all cylinders anymore uh, because you loaded up on caffeine already. You don't have a second wind. You're going to crash and not, and, and not be smart. There's a pacing you got to do yourself that like, hey, you know, is this a weekend tournament? Are we doing this Friday and Saturday and Sunday? If so, then I can't destroy my body on Friday. <laughs> If I'm assuming that I'm going to be playing in the final round on Sunday, you know, you guys think you should you assume that you'll you'll be successful. Mm-hmm. Then uh, pace yourself accordingly, and make sure to think about those things. How am I going to take breaks? I make sure to stand up. Uh, I need to uh, bring some food or figure out how I'm going to get food that is good uh, and not just pizza or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, at, I, so I, I'm referring to my experiences. Like I said, I, I haven't gone to face to face diplomacy tournaments, but I played a lot of tournaments for a lot of different games. That is very often a factor, in my opinion, especially when I'm up against, I'll say this, most of these tournaments I've gone to, when I get to final rounds, they're very young people, and they think they have infinite stamina, and that they can just Red Bull their way through, and they have this belief, it's a false belief, it's to my advantage, uh, because I have learned. I did that, I did that when I was a very young person, and I learned that that's not true, it doesn't work that way, Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, to think about how I'm going to uh, maintain myself. Now, I'll, I'll offer a little bit. This habit overlaps with, uh, I think, the wisdom of maturity because, uh, you know, I've, I've worked as, a, as an attorney uh, for years. And uh, I know that I have to get up tomorrow and work again and the next day after that and work again and day in and day out uh, every day, uh, sometimes literally every day, uh, usually work, work days. 
And uh, I got to do it again next week and the week after that and the month after that and the year after that. So I can't just destroy myself (laughs) on a given day or a given week to accomplish a short-term objective. Can't do it. I got to make sure that I get exercise. I got to make sure that I'm eating good meals. I got to make sure that I'm taking breaks and that, that I learned that like, Hey, you know, that's absolutely critical, uh, to be, to have my mind functioning correctly. And that habit that I developed from my experience working helped me become much better at playing in challenging tournaments like that, where you have to be on your A game day after day and be able to concentrate that much. I can do it for my job. I can do it for my job for weeks on end. Uh, so I could definitely do it in a tournament. And the way that I do that is not by drinking a bunch of Red Bull. Yeah. I mean, you talked earlier about, you know, again, going back to that generalization about diplomacy players, I mean, loving their own thoughts, you get lost in there and then pay a cost at the wrong At the time, you were not obviously planning to pay a cost. I think that that, um, that habit can come from playing online diplomacy where you think so, where you're spending a lot of your time looking at the board or composing your messages. But when you're playing a game in person, you're mostly looking at the other people and like glancing at the board to remember certain things like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what's going on. And I think that really changes how this is my opinion. I have from playing online a lot and playing face to face, like I said, not in tournaments, but I have played is that. Um, the mood when I'm playing face-to-face diplomacy is much more, like I said, like about survivor and who's going to get knocked out and who's working with who. And that's what the mood is about. And then moving the pieces is just kind of incidental. I've played a game where a player did not realize that Norway connected to St. Petersburg North Coast. And uh, just, you know, not mentioning that because it was advantageous to me that they didn't appreciate that was part of the game. You know, that was something that happened in the game. The tactics were just not so important. You know, the, knowing all the tactics might actually just get yourself killed <laughs> because the other right. players want to take you out. Yeah, man, you have to still to manage your own success, especially if someone doesn't know the, the provinces. <laughs> it could be risky. So I've been playing more gunboat recently. I've been trying to incorporate it more just to work on tactics. And I think it has helped with the instinctual move setting. So it's, it's much easier to be like, well, I'm just going to do this. And then if I have time later, I'll go back and think about it. You know, of course that'll pay dividends in the way you guys were talking about previously with regards to they, they just being able to make 85, 90% of your tactical moves just like right away. And then maybe agonize for, you know, five minutes if you have it about that last 10, 15% because there's no messaging and it's just kind of like, I don't, I don't tend to spend as much time agonizing about what needs to be done. I just kind of game out real quickly what I think are the most likely scenarios for people's movement and throw something in. I'm not getting distracted by the other people and what they're saying in those games. And so I think comfort with doing that or like building up that habit and then taking that MO into a face-to-face game could be an advantage. I'll add to that. I think that playing gunboat diplomacy really sharpens the senses for playing classic diplomacy because you you have to think things through yourself. You cannot rely on other players for advice or guidance or opinions or work things out. You have only yourself. And so you have to make sense of the situation and say like, well, who's winning here? You know, should I change sides? And you have to come up with heuristics for determining those things that just aren't based on what players are, are informing you. You have to really know. And so when you really know that equips you to play uh, press diplomacy and traditional diplomacy and go, okay, well, I have some reference level that I can use as a measure against the things players are telling me as to what's plausible or not plausible. And I'll add to that and say that if you really want to get good at thinking, play speedboat, which is a variant of gunboat diplomacy where you play like 10 minutes per turn online, then you have to think through everything really fast uh, and make your decision. And that can be very, very helpful in figuring things out uh, in face-to-face games since the time frame's not that long. And it's good to be in the habit of thinking through complex tactical situations quickly. Like in the beginning of a diplomacy game, the tactics are very simple. But if you're successful, the tactics will get very complicated because every piece you, you gain from making a capture really adds to the, com- the number of possible reasonable move sets that you can choose for your turn. And during the end game of diplomacy, if you're if you're trying to win, unless someone's deliberately throwing you the game, which is common enough, 
Uh, but let's say you're trying to win by force, by just tactically outwitting the other players and out, outguessing them. I think you need to be prepared to do that if you want to be a really great diplomacy player. Having played gunboat, especially fast gunboat games, will prepare your mind in face-to-face diplomacy as to like, oh yeah, I remember this position is indefensible, but this can be stalemated, so I need to prioritize this way. And if I add an extra fleet, that actually won't do anything. This fleet needs to go in this direction. Because if you're trying right. to win, nobody's giving you tips on that <laughs> during the end game. Right. Right. And you don't have to, yeah, you're not spending metal capital on figuring that out because you've gotten really used to, like you said, operating that way. Great. Good to go. Good to go. Any closing thoughts, Chris? You and everybody else needs to write more on variant maps. <laughs> really? Okay. I, I, I wouldn't mind hearing. Uh, uh, that's, an, that's an interesting closing thought. Uh, uh, what's motivating you? I'm uh, playing an ancient med game right now. And which I asked about on the server the other day, but I'm playing an ancient med game, and then I'm also involved in a uh, war in the Americas game. And I'm trying to find stuff, but it's a little bit tough. Oh, in, in the insights like what are the defensible positions? Who are your natural allies? That kind of thing. Uh, yeah, that kind of thing. Like, yeah, because especially with ancient med, you know, it was a smaller number of players, same number of SDs, a smaller number of supply centers, but you know small number of players but war in the americas is like grand like that's the word i keep using to talk about i can't knock it over how large that map is and uh it, yeah <laughs> i'm trying to stumble my way through it but it's uh, there's a lot more options like i feel like when i go back to regular you know european diplomacy i'm like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> it's a little smaller space i think that a motive of variant map designers is that uh what the designers or people who maybe the people who play variants find interesting is a map that is more complex and more open and usually less prone to stalemate lines uh this this may be a factor in why i play the variant maps quite rarely as most of the things that are different in the variant maps or like in the from the designer's perspective maybe even improved from the way that the uh original map is designed i consider to be worse uh and i I, i'm not Mm. not, i'm not speaking uh, objectively like worse for everyone in all situations but just for what i like about diplomacy Things like the confined map and the, and the way it's prone to stalemate situations, I, cons- I consider that to be a feature uh, that's interesting about the game and how quickly the ability of players to snap into those positions so easily makes it such a convoluted mental game to set up a situation uh, where they cannot do that. Whereas on a variant map where uh, eventually a player will accumulate a critical mass and just overpower everybody because there's no stalemate line, I mean, that's fine. That maybe some, that somebody's cup of tea because they like every game to end in a solo win. That's fine. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a bad game per se. Uh, that's just not, it's, I'm, I'm just less interested in it. So the variant map that maybe one that I really like, I think it's called World Diplomacy 9 or something like that. You can play it on a couple websites. And I, I think I came to it from Web Diplomacy. And something I really like about that map it's got a ridiculous amount of players there's something stupid like 13 players or what i don't remember maybe maybe more actually maybe maybe it's in the higher teens and uh it has these enormous sea zones but very intricate a landscape on the continents and so Mm -hmm. um it's really easy to form sea-based stalemate lines and really hard to get a beachhead on multiple continents and this lends itself to a similar uh, style of gameplay to what I like, which is that if you're planning to solo win on that map, which is probably even harder to solo win on than the classic map, you need to do things like prioritize getting beachheads on different continents over actually consolidating power, even though that's going to leave you vulnerable to backstabs by players who try to consolidate power on a given continent. To me, like, yes, yes, Mm -hmm. that is, that is diplomacy uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that I like. So my knowledge that the, the game is going to eventually end up in locked down stalemate position means positions means I need to get units spread out and far away even earlier maybe than I would uh, on the classic map. And I think that's really neat. So that's a map that I end up liking and have mm-hmm. played uh, a fair number of times and that I have advice about. I could probably tell you which powers are uh, very bad <laughs> and which ones are good. <laughs> 
So I guess it depends on the map. I have some theoretical thoughts about uh, the ancient Med map, which I like, but is maybe a bit too balanced for my taste. Right. It's very different than War in the America. I, I, I think, you know, traditional diplomacy is a happy medium between War in the Americas and ancient Med because, yeah, everybody runs for the, the body of water in the middle with ancient Med at least. Right. But like you said, War in the America. War in the America does have some interesting features to it, but it is very wide open. And it probably does lend itself to solos in that way. It has features that I find very common on variant maps, which is a lot of room to maneuver and a large number of neutral centers that are difficult to contest early on. In the classic diplomacy map, most of the neutral centers, many of them are contestable immediately. Most powers only have maybe one center that they're absolutely guaranteed to get. Some don't. This means that the game is really intense right from the start in terms of the negotiation. Whereas in the variants where the players have many natural neutrals, they haven't really chosen sides until they've maybe made some builds that lock them into a particular theater or something. So the the decision points aren't happening maybe until the second turn or even really the build phase. And that's interesting. And I, I know why play I know why I, I don't know. I suspect that the reason why variant designers and players who like variants are like so interested in this is it makes the game a slow boil that there's some opportunity for freebies and it's fun getting some free captures and you can't just get absolutely obliterated from the beginning without even getting one supply center. But I, I like that in the classic diplomacy map, yeah, you know, uh, some powers can get destroyed, that they can get absolutely destroyed. And so the very first, right from the very first turn, you better be giving it your full energy because major things are going to go down on spring 1901. Right. And with that, a plug for my favorite country, Austria. Sorry. <laughs> Shameless self-promoter of, my, of the Habsburg Empire here. <laughs> no, that's good. Just for the couple of thoughts. Yeah, sure. No, nothing else, though. All right. I'll see you around, Chris, and hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah, you too. Good talking, to Blake. This episode was made possible by the generous support of people like you. For more information, visit patreon.com slash brotherboard. You can learn more from your board brother at brotherboard.com. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe, share, and review. Thanks to Loyalty Freak Music for the theme music, It Feels Good to Be Alive too.